All right, I come here for a job. Uh, all right, uh, I think I can put you to work. No, I don't want to work, I just want a job. Well, how about references? That's all right, you don't need references. I like your face. And I like your face, if it is a face. <laughs> Tweet. Say, you know, uh, you look exactly like a fellow I used to know by the name of Emmanuel Ravelli. Are you his brother? I am Emmanuel Ravelli. You're Emmanuel Ravelli? I am Emmanuel Ravelli. Well, no wonder you look like him. But I still insist there's a resemblance. <laughs> he thinks I look alike. Well, if you do, it's a tough break for both of you. Hey, come on, we don't speak about money. Well, that suits me fine. If you promise not to say anything about it, I won't mention it either. All right, but I gotta have more money. Well, I'll tell you what to do. Uh, I'll give you $6 a week and uh, you can bring your own lunch. Well... I'll go even further than that. You can bring $6 a week and you can bring lunch for me, too. All right, I think about it. $6. Hey, boss, I can't live on $6 a week. You can't live on $6 a week? Oh. Well, that would make me very happy. You're hired. All right, when do I start? <laughs> well, let's see. It's 1 o'clock now. Uh, if, you, if you start now, you can be back here at 3 with a lunch. You can bring me a tomato sandwich on white bread. I don't got a white bread, but I can give you rye. All right, I'll take a quarter rye. I'm sorry, but I'm wearing them. You're wearing a quarter rye? Yes, my quarter rye pants. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one too. Say, why don't you get double pneumonia? I don't need it. I'm a single man. Hey, come on, we don't speak about money. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, have you had any uh, experience? Sure, I got plenty of experience. For 15 years, I'm a musician. Oh, you're a musician, eh? Uh, well, uh, what do you get an hour? Well, for playing, I get $10 an hour. What do you get for not play? Twelve dollars an hour. <laughs> That's more like it. Mm. Now, for rehearsing, I make you a special rate. Fifteen dollars an hour. What do you get for not rehearsing? Oh, you couldn't afford it. You see, I know rehearse, I know play. I know play, that runs into money. <laughs> what would you want to run into an open manhole? Just the cover charge. <laughs> <laughs> well, drop in sometime. Sewer. <laughs> well, I guess we clean that up. <laughs> no, we no clean that up. Now, let's see how we stand. Flat-footed, usually. All right. Now, uh, yesterday I didn't come. You remember yes, yesterday I, remember I didn't that. come. My favorite day of the week. All right. That's <laughs> $15 you owe me. Uh, today I did come. That's $20 you owe me. Hey, you know I could lose money on this. I certainly hope so. All right. Now, tomorrow I go away. That's worth about... A million bucks. Well, that's not equivalent of money. I offered you $6. I raised you two. You raised me two. I raised you three. I call you. What do you got? I got aces off. What do you got? I got a notion to throw you out of my office. All right. I take it. Is this a hallucination on <laughs> a real show on the real Marx Brothers? Is or what? Whatever is it is, I'm against it. Yeah. You know, that's there, the name of the show. Go. Whatever it is, I'm against it. That's the Theater J. And I'd like to introduce you to our guests today, Chico and Groucho Marx, Gary Tells playing Chico, and Richard Rohan playing Groucho. Mm -hmm. And a wonderful representation it is. Well, thank you very stunning, much. Stunning, stunning. I like a little sure. smidge. Just a little smidge. Now, that's kind of weird. Something. I just thought of something. The Marx, the Marx Brothers always played the Marsh Brothers. Isn't that weird? They never got to do Hamlet. Well, that's true. Yeah, they were playing Otis P. Driftwood and the Ciccolini oh, and yeah. uh, oh, Ronnie Belli. And, and, and Marsh by any other name would be yeah, right. just an inexhaustible well. repertoire. That's certainly true. Yeah. So Theater J yeah. is where? It's in Washington? Yes, it's uh, it's about uh, five minutes from DuPont Circle. Right, below DuPont Circle, uh, Jefferson Place. You can get there on the red line. Awesome, and, uh, so uh, if you don't south. drive, you can still see it. Right. And you're mm -hmm. running now and you run until November 28th. Right, and Good. hopefully longer. Good, yes. check the screen for the number. That's right. Come and see it, it's amazing. Now how did you guys prepare for this show? Uh, watch a lot of movies. Uh, uh, Basically, <laughs> over and over and over and over and over again and over relentlessly. Well, we did uh, we did a show at Theater J uh, two years ago called A Night in Ukraine, which was an original Marx Brothers that the Marx Brothers not, never got a chance to do. Based uh, on uh, the Chekhov play, the the bear, the bear or the boar. Oh, so it was a synthesized a new a new piece. And yeah, it was uh, it was originally part of uh, it was a Broadway show that had uh, the first act was a little musical review homage to Hollywood in its heyday, and then the second act was a, like a new Marx Brothers movie, was the premise. Well, we did just the second act. We did a uh, very fast-paced, 45-minute, uh, one-act uh, representation of the Marx Brothers. New new material. You got great reviews. Yeah, it, well. was, it was very overseas. We extended and, right. and uh, we did very well with it. it. We wouldn't be doing this now if it hadn't <laughs> done well, I think. It's, so. it's still the funny stuff in the world. I mean, I've, yeah. I've got my one tape with four Marx Brothers movies on it, and I can watch yeah. it end to end, any oh, afternoon. Yeah. You know? Well, is it really fun as actors? You you have a broad range of talents as actors. You don't just do comedy, but is it fun to revisit these roles and, and oh, to kind oh, of get course. into that zany? Well, it's like a dream come true because, yeah. you know, when I was a little kid, you know, first time I saw the Marx Brothers, 
I thought they were the hippest, and this is like what 65 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Right? when you were a little kid, or when they were. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, when I was a little kid, right? They, they were tough. <laughs> but uh, you it's know, it's amazing what makeup can do. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Well, you know, I live right. I only smoke half a pack. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. Hey, I'm and, uh, but, uh, you know, and, and I look at stuff today and it still, you know, still stands up way better than a lot of the stuff you see on TV. Oh, know? yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And, and, and so. it, that goes for almost any of it. But it, but it strikes me when I watch those movies that, um, who was the, the Algonquin Roundtable writer? Uh, the glasses. Wolcott. Yeah, Alexander Wolcott. No, no, no. This is a uh, guy that wrote their movies. S.J. Perlman. S.J. Perlman. Perlman, right. That, that S.J. Perlman's movies are... Uh, plays are much funnier than some of the other ones. That mm -hmm. the jokes are, are more intelligent, snappier. Well, they Do you had, find that when you watch those movies? They had also? fabulous writers. They had George S. Kaufman oh, writing right. for... That's uh, the guy I'm thinking about. He was Tom the one Ruby, that... Yeah. Tom Arn Ruby the wrote The Diary. The, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah well, the, most of the stuff that we're doing is called from uh, radio shows that Groucho and Chico did in the uh, season of 1931 through 32. No, 32 through 33, actually. Uh, it's interesting, because if you look at all the scripts, uh, there are 24 of them existing. The first part of the season, they make reference to President Hoover, and the second part of the season, to President Roosevelt. Roosevelt. So there's that. It's kind of an interesting little snippet of uh, American history there, uh, encapsulated in the in the 24 episodes of Flywheel, Shyster, and Flywheel. So they were doing radio. Yeah. Where does that fit That's in there? That's why Harpo isn't here. They did. They did. <laughs> <laughs> he what? did props. Easy on yeah. budget. Well, we thought about that. We thought about using Groucho as, uh, or uh, Harpo as the uh, the props person on the show, but yeah. uh, it didn't quite work out. With I mean, we were limited to the number of people we could use. Oh, the right. space is very small. Sorry, it's it's smaller than this Groucho bed. Marks on the air. On the air. Okay. There you go. Okay. Who directed? Before I forget. Joe Bano. Oh, okay. okay. And he did Night in the Ukraine. Night in the Ukraine. Right. The only man for the job. So it sounds like a treat for even Marx Brothers aficionados because they're going to be seeing some vintage material oh, that's yeah. not out and of... And people who haven't, and it's, you know, bring the kids. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, right. it's, it's good family stuff. entertainment. It's family entertainment, All the Dublin too Sanders dirty. Go right over there. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. uh, I see you bending over a hot stove, but I don't see, I don't see the stove. stove. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there was some uh, girl was there the other night, and she was lo loving it. She was squealing and crying. Never, she'd never, she'd never she'd seen, seen a black and white movie before. Yeah, that's a sad testimony, unfortunately. Well, now I think she'll probably see some Marx Brothers. What do you think about, when you look at a Marx Brothers movie, and you look at the scenes, and you look at some one of these country houses, the Art Deco stuff, mm -hmm. or the Ocean Liner, and you think, you know, this is this is so much more than just the hilarity of the Marx Brothers. This is the, the opulence and luxury of what mm -hmm. America was before mm -hmm. we ran all the robber barons out of business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well the, that's, have you done that yet? Uh, yeah. Well, it's supposed to coming next week. Oh, that's right. Right. <laughs> the robber barons. We have group, two shows on Saturday, so <laughs> you know, half the you know they're staying at the Hilton. And, uh, <laughs> the robber barons joining us. Yeah. That's right. Um, no, but the, the very thing you were mentioning was, you know, this, you know, built up, uh, you know, the, the, the pomposity of it is the very thing that was the perfect foil for them. Yeah, that's true. in the marvelous Margaret Dumont. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Yes, yes Margaret Dumont. That's, uh, do you have a Margaret Dumont character? Oh, of course. Mm, of course. We to. get, uh, we, uh, Meredith uh, Patterson, Meredith Patterson does a fabulous. Right. She does, but she's she does right. more than Margaret Dumont. She does uh, two other characters in the show right. here that are opposite ends of the spectrum. She does a Thelma Todd equivalent. And there were a couple of um, Marx Brothers films where Margaret Dumont wasn't even in. Uh, Horse Feathers and uh, and Monkey, uh, Monkey Business. Monkey Business. Yeah. And Thelma Todd was the the ingenue type that Groucho played with. It was right. a different type of relationship because she was actually good looking and yeah. And, and so it was there was. <laughs> But he almost had he had something of the same thing, even with the cute ones that that he he, oh, yeah. oh, he would insult seduction. Them. Oh sure, oh yeah, terrible, totally. yeah, definitely, totally. definitely. Yeah. Plus we got two other and we have two other fine uh, uh, Jack Vernon and uh, and uh, Michael Replogle. Right. and uh, so, yeah, they're they're what we fabulous. Do you have a Zeppo character? Sings the stupid uh, song? Uh, no. <laughs> no, not really. No, Zeppo? but uh, neither should live with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, poor Zeppo gets saddled with all the straight material, but. Uh, the word is that he was one of the funniest off screen, and he just sort of, there wasn't a spot for him anymore. He had the Animal Crackers. Crackers story. Yeah, supposedly, Groucho got sick during the run of Animal Crackers on Broadway. I mean, I don't think this is apocryphal. It's a great story anyway. If it is. Uh, if it is. Um, and Zeppo took over, did the part on, on uh, did Groucho, and was fabulous, and nobody knew the difference. It well, they looked announced. so alike. Exactly. Yeah. Well, any of them, well, you look at the scene in Duck Soup, but exactly. when they all have the grease paint on. They look exactly the you same. You can't tell who they are, except all of a sudden Groucho's talking with an Italian accent. <laughs> now, so. when, they were, when they were kids, when they started out, and, and they were the, the 5, 10, 11 Marx Brothers, <laughs> and their mother was dragging them around to, sh to do shows, 
Um, they were making this stuff up themselves. Um, uh, the well, comedy routine. They sort weren't. of. They they started out as a, as a song team. Uh, the Nightingales. The Nightingales, the, the, Nightingales. The, doing vaudeville. With uh, vaudeville, the vaudeville, the lower the lower rung of the vaudeville circuit. Right. Uh, um, uh, Chico went off on his own to start with. He he left fam the family at like 15 or 16 or something like. Went off doing Marx uh, and Gordoni. And Gordoni. He had a he, uh, Chico was the accompanist, but he still did the Italian accent. He latched onto the Italian accent very quickly. Yeah. And and that's obviously that stuck with him for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, and then he had a song a singer that was with him or a crooner as they called him in those days. And they were not very successful. They but they they kept going basically. Mm -hmm. And for five years and then Chico would always take the money for the group. And go out and gamble, <laughs> gamble it away. I think he did. He gambled it away. Exactly. It, it yeah. ruined him. It's so when they got life. when they hit it big in Hollywood, here comes here comes Chico. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here comes. Well, no, he's, he, the, one no, he's the one that oh, got he, them. He, he, he was the he them. was the the actually the agent for them. He right. he negotiated all the big deals. So they they really wouldn't have been anything well, without Chico. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> so you don't take it personally. Do so you? did you take a cigar to the audition the first time around for Ukraine? I mean, how did you prepare uh, for that? Yeah, actually, I think I did have a cigar. Uh, the initial audition... We had a line of Groucho. <laughs> it was really <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, well, it's like the scene in the producers, you know, where the, where the dancing Hitlers, please wait in the wings, we're only singing singing Hitlers. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was pretty ridiculous. And Hitlers who sing it too. Yeah, Hitlers right. who dance for <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. So, uh, That's great. And they took pictures of us. Uh, well, they, at the call, they took pictures of everybody, and there were a few of us that came in regalia. I didn't put this on until until the callbacks, just in case they, you know, needed added emphasis that I could look like the guy. Um, oh, but I also brought a picture to the, you know, the tr in, in the makeup so they knew good. what That's I looked good. like. Yeah, yeah, sometimes casting directors get a little bit short of vision. I don't know yeah, why. At amazing. that crucial time, they seem to become Well, really they'll tell serious. you. They'll tell you, don't dress like the part. Oh, don't worry about it. We can imagine. Forget it. Give them everything they need for, yeah. to make the decision. Because, <laughs> of course, I'm alienating casting directors left and right now. <laughs> no, you're not. No, I'm you're never working again. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. <laughs> so, outside of the Marx Brothers, what kind of things interest you? I mean, do you mm. want to become a playwright eventually? Are you oh, no, a director? No, 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 no. Gary, do you, uh, <laughs> do you have an interest in Greek tragedy? I mean, are you just in for fun? Your whole life is a Greek tragedy. Your whole life is a Greek tragedy. You've been doing this too long. Yeah, I can I'm see that. So. I just, I'm studying to be a wastrel. You know? <laughs> 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 I'm working, I do my Guaranteed way success. That's quite a strategy. strategy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, or yeah, buskers, or uh, or beggars, or yeah. yeah. yeah and how about you, Richard? Well, yeah, I'm uh, I'm a, an aspiring actor, of course, and I'm, now I'm a perspiring actor actually. <laughs> but uh, uh, the the whole Groucho thing was something that I realized I could hook. I've always I'd always loved the Marx Brothers, and I thought, what a great marketing device if I could do this. Because you know, actors are a dime a dozen, and, and hey! yeah, I'm afraid so. Well, we're actually we're more like a dime a hundred. <laughs> so you got to come up with an angle. And so we're you come not up with an angle, and I thought, well, you know, there aren't too many people that look enough like Groucho and could do have the technical skills that could do a good impersonation that could go beyond an impersonation. Because we're we have to give a performance that lives and breathes, and obviously we have to improvise, and uh, it's more than just being a mimic. Uh, right. Hopefully, we like to think what we do is something that you know maybe Rich Little or somebody who's an impersonator couldn't do. Right. Yeah, because right. You they could get the sound right, but they wouldn't they be get the, the sound right. They wouldn't act. be able to write, and, yeah. and, and do the physicality that goes into the the, the character. It's uh, well, well. The great thing about artists is that most of them are iconoclasts. So just remember, whatever it is, I'm against it. Come and Perfect. see it, there Theater J, Groucho Marx on the air. And gentlemen, we want to thank you very much thank for being here. Say the secret word. You and win a few bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and Jeez. thanks for joining us on Thank Slumber you. Party. We could have only done this for four hours. Nice wrap up. Before they even got to the end of my favorite routine. I didn't even see the cue. <laughs> Bye. It's subtle. Bye. Okay. okay, we're going to go from Marx to Marxism. What's the secret void, Miles? Assassination. Ooh. Ooh. We're back with Gus Russo. Hi, who, Gus. Who now can talk about the really weird inside scoop. We've got a couple of bombshells in this envelope, just Ooh. as Senator McCarthy had. And you thought after the Warren report there could be no new information. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, of, of, when you think about the Warren report, and you've ever looked at that thing, it's like this long. And if you look at all the books I've ever written about it, it's like another mile of books. And yet this is six seconds or something on, on Elm Street in Dallas, 1963. Mm -hmm. And as we go to try to reconstruct that moment from every angle, what was every participant doing in this whole thing? You realize that even the simplest thing in your whole life you couldn't reconstruct. You can't figure out why things happen. Is that what they found out? Exactly. And for me, it's been a real lesson in human behavior and uh, uh, 
because I've learned that the accuracy of people's memory is, is so faulty that uh, you can't you don't know what to believe historically when people say I think I remember even a day before or two days before let alone 30 years ago um, it's so hard to reconstruct almost Im probably impossible especially when shots are being fired I mean are you thinking are you observing or are you ducking exactly. I mean that would have to be a lot of it concern for your own personal safety right well, I was on the set for the uh, the Oliver Stone movie when they reconstructed the motorcade sequence we all knew of course they were going to reconstruct the shooting and everything so we're prepared and we even couldn't tell how many shots there were. We knew they were coming because we were so distracted by the visual that we, I remember turning to somebody and saying, it was three shots that time, right? And, and, and they said, no, it was four, wasn't it? And we knew it was going to happen. Wow. So that really hit home to me about how tough it is to really, you know, have everything tuned in. At the what same was it like time. in Dallas then? I mean, you were, you were there with the, with the local people. This can't be a, a, something they remember with any fondness. I mean, um, right. You mean in the shoot or in the actual well, event? Well, I mean, uh, they're redoing the event in Dallas. Right, I mean, what was the, what were the local people like? I mean, I would have thought this would have been like, you know, don't do that here. The last thing we want to revisit. Get a sound stage somewhere, for God's sake. Yeah, the locals were, were standoffish a bit, or, or blasé for sure. They, they weren't excited about it. As a matter of fact, Stone had a, a, a tough time getting the licenses to do this. The city right. council just turned them down for months and months and months. And there was a little uh, backdoor negotiating that went on, and finally he, he worked his way in. But they didn't want it originally. So. Well, that's, that's, that's believable. Now, let's talk about... Um, Lee Harvey. Um, when we left Lee Harvey, he was a miserable child, a, a poor socializer. How did he get from being just sort of uh, Wanting a, desperately a nerdy to outcast to the Marine Corps, to Russia, and back to kill Kennedy? Well, that's the $64,000 question. <laughs> I don't have that much, but I mean, <laughs> uh, what do you well, for nothing? Yeah, yeah, right. Well, the Marine Corps is easy to explain. The Marine Corps was basically to get away from his very cloistered existence with his mother right. and to get away from that whole uh, existence that he had and it wasn't anything to do with uh, patriotic marine things, it was just to get away from home and uh, so that explains that. Russia was, uh, he was very disillusioned in the United States, uh, his mother was poor, he was poor. Um, Did he dislike the service or? He, dis he ended up being disillusioned with the Marines after about a year and there. He hated that. He couldn't wait to get out. He was studying Russian and Marxism in the Marines. I mean, in the bunk next to a very patriotic you know, grunt, he's spouting Marxism. It was very bizarre oh. stuff. So that two days after he was out, he went to Russia. And um, he got disillusioned with that. After about a year, he hated being in Russia. So he hated everywhere. The only thing left for him, it turned out, was Cuba. That was the last pure Marxist thing left on the planet. And um, so uh, that was his dream to get back to Cuba. Right. Eventually. He could never learn Chinese. I guess that would have been one of his other thoughts. But right. A lot easier to learn Spanish than Chinese. So he goes from being a celebrity <clears throat> in Moscow and then comes back to the United States or goes to Cuba? He wants to go to Cuba. He came back to the United States and, and eventually he wanted to get to Cuba. He never made it. Okay. Uh, he uh, uh, left uh, Russia pretty much a celebrity, but when he came back here, there was nobody to meet him at the airport. In fact, he remarked to his brother who met him at the uh, Fort Worth or Dallas-Fort Worth airport, where's all the press? He really wanted to be a big shot, and he was so upset when they weren't there. And so everything just fell apart for him. And then he went to New Orleans to try to uh, start a, uh, a TV debate down there and radio debates, and it led to nothing. He thought he was going to be the this big avatar, so had and it never happened. Sort of delusions or, yeah, oh, I yeah, guess, definitely. a normal person, we call them ambitions. Um, we in addition to his marriage, was falling apart big time, so everything was collapsing on the guy. We have a beautiful picture of him in high school where he looks just like um, uh, the guy from Saturday Night Live, as a matter of fact. Doesn't he, Dana Carvey? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is interesting because uh, uh, one of the theories that went around about why he would have done this was, was that he was hypno-programmed. Of course, the CIA did yeah, have I that do kind of that, a program <clears throat> starting in the early 50s. And so I located this picture, just curiously enough, in, in his high school yearbook where he's being hypnotized by a fellow classmate. We now, I don't think we ever ended up using it, but... Um, so maybe Janet Bolin. Bolin is the one yeah, really she, she could be the one. She we should be could looking be for it. <laughs> she programmed it back then. <laughs> being your hypnotized. The <laughs> um, well, I guess one of the bottom lines of this thing for you has been the, to come to the realization that despite all the, the implausibility of the explanation, it's probably true that Oswald was a lone assassin mm -hmm. and went up into the tower all on his own and shot the president. Yeah, I mean, that, the big questions are, was he capable of doing it alone? And if he did do it alone, did anybody get him to do it? 
Right, mm -hmm. and the show we had last week on Frontline, for those who didn't see it, uh, basically what we came to was that he was very capable, both emotionally and physically, of doing this. And uh, But the flip side of the coin was we found he was indeed associating with uh, people who uh, wanted to conspire to kill Kennedy. Ferry. David Ferry, among others. Uh, the story there, if you want to hear what that is, David Ferry was a well-known New Orleans radical associating with uh, the Cuban exiles. And he was well known to hate Kennedy, talk about let's kill him. This was known. This is not right. a real, real question. They hated thing. him because of the whole Bay of Pigs fiasco. Exactly, and, okay. yeah. And also it was clear that Kennedy had no intention of going back in where he had promised the Cuban exiles in right. the country, I'm going to go back in. We didn't they really felt mean abandoned. That. Yeah, so they felt abandoned. And Ferry was spearheading a radical group of Cuban, Cuban exiles who wanted to kill Kennedy, basically. They're the same people that are up in our fly space banging on the pipes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see them everywhere I go. Uh, but Ferry always denied that he knew Oswald. Exactly. And, and it's never been proven. Uh, and Oliver Stone had it in his movie, uh, the allegations of David Ferry and Jim Garrison, the district attorney exactly. in New Orleans, who said they knew each other. But there was no proof. But we got lucky, uh, as uh, we saw with our Frontline piece, um, this may be the first airing of it on television besides the Frontline show. We found a photo in New Orleans of Oswald and Ferry together. You'll notice on the extreme right, um, Lee Harvey. Lee Harvey is a Civil Air Patrol picture. And the second from the left is Captain David Ferry, his commander. And uh, they're at a picnic with the Civil Air Patrol. So there's only eight people in this group, yeah. so I mean. He would have known yeah. Yeah, who the kid was. And, and New Orleans is a very small town, socially speaking. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah. So when he comes back from Russia, uh, it, it's uh, very believable that they would have run into each other again. And so you're thinking maybe Ferry could have been the guy that, that finds this... Uh, well, wait a minute, no. He's, he's on the opposite political side. Exactly. Oswald... These, uh, Ferry's group wanted to kill Kennedy. Right. Oswald, for some reason, will never know wanted to kill Kennedy. Yeah. Um, the, the bizarre thing in all this is you have to understand that the far right and the far left both hated Kennedy. I know. I, I, so they could have tricked him into saying you're doing it for the far right or the far left, it doesn't matter. Well, and they, we, they certainly adopted the same methods as mm -hmm. extremists, yeah, oh and yeah. they were t training one another. I mean, you saw that later on in the, in the 60s and 70s, where FBI guys were infiltrating radical leftist sure. groups and teaching them how to build bombs, yeah. for God's mm -hmm. sake. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Before all the entrapment laws and everything. Yeah, that's true. There was, Jay Edgar had him out there um, investigating the Black Panthers. Okay, so we've got We've got so, all this going on together, all this activity. But which we also have a very important other thing that you've raised, oblique, uh, you know, sort of tangentially, which is here's this guy who's pissed off because people aren't making a fuss about him. Right, right. And I, maybe this, this this motivates a lot of uh, assassin type behavior. You know, just I'm going to be famous one way or another. You know, and it's people that have been ignored and and feel like I've, I'm a great person, but nobody will let me get anywhere. And that Maybe people also who've been particularly browbeaten about the social rules. I mean, it sounds like his mother was just a tyrant who... And his wife, know, too. I mean, she took every opportunity to, to, to bust his balls to uh, coin a phrase. Uh, your mother I mean, or your wife? <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. And uh, I feel like saying the poor guy, because everywhere he turned to a female, it was just hell. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, the night before the assassination, he went back to see his wife. They were separated right. in an effort to patch things up. And she said no. And the big question is, had she said yes, that's all it would have taken for this to never have happened, probably. Or at least not happened that day. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Had, he, had he received some measure of acceptance exactly. in some yeah. quarter. Exactly. So, but now, let's see, now, he, he had the gun uh, fairly long in advance of the shooting. Maybe nine, ten months. Yeah. Later. And... What, what does he think of doing with the gun? You, you assume th that this has been in his mind for some time? No, not the Kennedy thing. I think that came relatively late in the whole progression in his life. Uh, he bought the weapon in April of 63. Uh, a few days after he received it, he went out and tried to shoot General Walker. So Who was General Walker? He was a right-wing uh, politico living in Dallas who was uh, arrested uh, at the uh, Alabama, University of Alabama, or University of Mississippi uh, sit-ins uh, trying to get the blacks admi admi admitted into... Uh, University of Mississippi. Well, he was one of the right wingers trying to keep them out. He was arrested. He was a demagogue. Oswald hated him for some reason, and uh, uh, he was getting more press. <laughs> he was getting more, yeah, he was getting, getting more press. How did they find out that Oswald tried to shoot him? Or did this was this? Republic it didn't come out after the assassination. Marina, his Oswald's wife, widow, uh, told the authorities that, oh yeah, I remember the night he went out to shoot Walker, and so that's how they solved the Walker case. They never did it. They had no suspects up oh until my that God. point. Wow. So he, he was... Uh, he was going to shoot somebody. He was going to shoot somebody, yeah. And you found that you determined um, one of the, the essential facts of this, as I can remember from a lot of the speculation of the Warren um, thing, they said nobody could fire 
three shots in 2.2 seconds or whatever right. it was. Right. And of course you found out that he was a hell of a shot. He was a good shot, but it turns out we've been misled as far as the numbers. It's been a real numbers game. It hasn't been three shots in so many five seconds or whatever you've heard. It was two shots in eight seconds is what it turns out to be. And once you get those numbers That's accurate, plausible. piece of cake. How did they figure that out? Well, uh, by looking at the Zapruder film, a very clear print of the Zapruder film. Now this is an amateur who was taking a home movie at exactly. the time of the assassination. And they showed that they 50 a times of JFK to the point where I just like, every time okay. I know it's coming But going. just for the benefit of those who like me, <laughs> go, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Oliver Stone? <laughs> right, right. Well, the, uh, if you look at the, it very closely, you'll notice everybody reacts to something at a very much earlier stage than we thought before. We've interviewed the people in the film who are reacting. We asked them, why did you react? And they said, I was reacting to a shot. So we can time the first shot, the okay. one that missed everything. Yeah, okay, so one shot missed everything and the right. other shot did everything. No, there was three shots. The second shot wounded the president and the governor sitting in front of him. Right. The third that shot, which was the final shot, um, hit it and blew his head off for right. all intents and purposes. We know that was the last shot, and now we know when the first shot was, and there's eight seconds between them. So where did the magic bullet come from? The that was the second shot that did all the wounding of Kennedy's throat, Connolly's back, and it's been um, oversimplified. People have said that uh, it couldn't be done, and it really can, it turns out. The bullet wow. would, even right. after tumbling through both yeah. of them, would... It's an amazing bullet. Excuse yeah. me, Miles, before we get to our last shot, Gus, <laughs> um, what do you hope will come out of this? I know you have a, a book on another subject. At well, the, no, it's at on the this subject, Is it actually, on this subject? Yeah, yeah. And, more, and more you have political. a publisher? Yeah, we're doing a book for Simon & Schuster on the political landscape surrounding this event, and we'll deliver that probably in the fall of 94. Cool. Are we totally so out of time? For those of you who missed the Frontline episode can um, look for Gus Russo's book, which is yet to be titled, That's but it right, will be yeah. about about who, who was Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. And um, we'd just like to thank you for being here. Thank you. Oh, My pleasure. Okay. We're out of time We're already. out of time again already, Miles. <laughs> can you thank our guest? Uh, Gus, thank you so much for coming <laughs> on you. again. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, yeah. And um, I want to have him back again because I've got about uh, two or more hours questions on the same <laughs> subject. I know. Um, like, for instance, um, if you think about that's kind of like when America lost its, uh, you could say, gullibility or innocence or any of those things where uh, since that time, it seems to me that we have no longer believed what any politician said about anything. No, we didn't believe the government, the army, any of that stuff. Was it, when did it become like that? We, we were, the Eisenhower 50s, we don't believe any damn thing. You said the communists are all bad or that, you know, this is well, all people bad. people who watch Slumber Party do believe anything. <laughs> no, no, say it's not so. <laughs> but I mean, but, we do it with mirrors. But, <laughs> but, but since the 60s, I mean, we never believed anything since then. That's true. It was a watershed uh, time. And, but history. it was that event. No, it was all the acid we took. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was later. That was later. Darn. Thought I had it right. Yeah. No, it, it, I think it was that event. Yeah, I really do. I do too. You know, it, it's amazing well, that the one event that, could I mean, do that. It used, it's, it's kind of like a passage of divine right of kings because before that, although McKinley was attempted to be assassinated, right. Right, mm -hmm. before that, you just didn't touch the president. I mean, people did not kill the president of the United States. Yeah, well, that's true. And since then, we lost Bobby. We almost lost Ronnie. You know? Thank God we lost Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> I love it.